afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fred Court. I'm a member of the Department of Political Science at the University of Connecticut, and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Pfizer Colloquium. We are pleased that our audience includes statisticians from industry, faculty members of sister institutions of higher learning in the New England area, and of course, members of the staff and students at the University of Connecticut. The annual Pfizer Colloquia are devoted to presentations by distinguished statisticians who have international reputations and who have made monumental contributions to the development of the discipline. In this respect, each Pfizer Colloquium is an important event in the history of statistics. Its significance certainly is not limited, however, to this field of knowledge. The fact that I, as a political scientist, have the honor to make the opening remarks today clearly indicates that these colloquia have an interdisciplinary character, a quality for which there is an acute need in a world in which knowledge has become highly specialized and sometimes unduly compartmentalized. Professor Harry Poston of the Statistics Department at the University of Connecticut now will introduce Professor Harold Cremer, the speaker for the third Pfizer Colloquium. Professor Poston. Thank you, Professor Court. As Professor Court has indicated, this is our third annual Pfizer Colloquium. These programs are supported by Pfizer Central Research, Pfizer Incorporated, and they bring to Connecticut the finest internationally recognized scientist in the field of statistics. Today we have as our speaker one of the most distinguished mathematical statisticians in the world, Dr. Harold Cremer of the University of Stockholm. Because of the importance of this event, we are videotaping the presentation for the film archives of the American Statistical Association. Dr. Cremer's research career has extended over a period of more than half a century, and his contributions to the theory of statistical inference and the theory of probability have been extensive. On the statistical side, we are all familiar with the results of his proof of the statement that when an unknown parameter is estimated from a set of statistical data, the precision cannot be improved beyond a certain limit, the famous cremer rao inequality. On the probability side, his research covers a number of, mo of areas of modern probability theory, including results on limit theorem, on the classical gambler's rune problem, spectral representation of stochastic processes, and stochastic processes in general. His applications of the theory of stochastic processes to the area of risk theory has led to many important applications in the insurance industry. Throughout his career, Dr. Cremer has been one of the world's outstanding authorities on the mathematical theory of risk in insurance and has been president of the Society of Swedish Actuaries for a period of 30 years. He has received many honors for his scientific contributions, including the Guy Medal in Gold from the Royal Statistical Society and honorary doctorate degrees from six universities throughout the world, the universities of Edinburgh, Princeton, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Calcutta, and Paris. Professor Cremer's contributions also include authorship of five books. Among these are his Elements of Probability Theory, known to his students as the Little Cremer, and Collective Risk Theory, which provides a survey of the area of the theory of risk. He, however, is most famous for his landmark book, The Mathematical Methods of Statistics, published in 1945, the American edition in 1946. This book was the first treatise on statistics in which the mathematical developments were carried through according to the standards of rigor in pure mathematics. This book integrated the modern statistical concepts developed by the English and American schools of statisticians with the mathematical methods of the modern work in probability of the French and Russians. He also added some of his own works, and this text ushered in a new era in the rigorous teaching of statistical inference, 
this great Khmer, as the book became known to his students, was subsequently translated into Russian, Spanish, Polish, and Japanese, and was used throughout the world. Professor Khmer has lectured widely throughout the United States, Western Union, the USSR, and India. His contributions, however, have been more than just scholarly. He was president of Stockholm University from 1950 through 1958, and chancellor of the Swedish university system from 1958 through 1961. Since retirement, he has continued to publish and lecture, as you will witness today. When I invited Professor Khmer to be our Pfizer colloquium speaker this year, I had hopes that he would provide a historical talk on the development of statistical inference and on some of the contributors to this field. I am most pleased that this is exactly what he will be talking about today, and I am certain that at the conclusion of the lecture, the members of the audience will consider themselves fortunate to have been present today. The title of Dr. Khmer's talk is Mathematical Probability and Statistical Inference, Some Recollections from an Important Phase of Scientific Development. I now have the honor of introducing to you Professor Harold Khmer. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Professor Poston, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to have been invited to give this third Pfizer Colloquium, and I'm indeed very grateful for the extremely kind words of welcome that I have been allowed to listen to. I am so glad to have also this opportunity to come back to stores where I was 10 years ago and from which I have so many pleasant memories as from so many other places all around in the United States of America. Today I propose to give a few personal recollections of the development of two important scientific fields, the purely mathematical probability theory and the methodology of statistical inference. These fields are intimately and necessarily related, but still they have sometimes developed more or less independently, sometimes in close connection. During the very important phase of development, which these two scientific fields had during the 20 years between the two world wars. Examples of both these kinds of works independently or in close connection can be found. And the main part of my talk will consist of some recollections of the complete transformation of both these fields brought about during the development between that period of 20 years between the two world wars and then some scattered remarks on subsequent history. I shall be talking from a strictly personal point of view, giving my impressions of those events that appeal to my personal interest as I remember them today many years afterwards. But I will begin with a brief bird's eye view of the development of these fields 
up to the end of the First World War. The first attempt to use what we now call mathematical probability to predict the values of statistical frequency ratios was, as everybody knows, due to the gamblers. They sometimes found that the loss, that practical experience, didn't agree with their computational chances. It is well known that about 1650 in Paris, one of these unfortunate gamblers consulted Blaise Pascal and that this led to the beginning of a scientific study of probability which soon attracted a great interest. James Bernoulli of the famous Swiss mathematical family gave an account of this new theory in his posthumous work of 1713 Ars Conjectandi, or the Art of Conjecture. It may be interesting to recall that the words he actually used were Ars Conjectandi Sive Stochastica. And I believe that is the first time that one encounters the term stochastic in this respect this term that has since been so much used. He gave in his great book the mathematical theory as far as it was then developed and he pointed out the possibility of its application to various questions not only in gambling but also in social science, in economics and in meteorology. He proved his well-known theorem leading from a known probability to a predicted approximate value of a statistical frequency <coughs> ratio. And he also argued in an op the opposite direction from an observed frequency ratio to an estimate of the corresponding probability. I believe it's fair to say that he was the first to see the possibility of using probability theory as a tool for drawing valid inferences from statistical data. Almost exactly 100 years after the Ars Conjectandi, in 1812 appeared the great work of Laplace, Theorie Analytique de Probabilité. It covered a great field of both mathematical theory and statistical applications and offers a stimulating reading but it was often regrettably non-rigorous from a mathematical point of view and it was surprisingly uncritical in respect of the foundations and the statistical applications of the theory. For Laplace, the probability definition based of the famous equally possible cases occurring in the simple games of chance was evidently applicable everywhere. And his main theoretical contribution, the highly important proposition known to us as the central limit theorem of probability theory was stated without a complete proof. During one time of his career, Laplace served as a minister of the Emperor Napoleon, who afterwards criticized him severely 
saying that he introduced l'esprit des infiniment petit, the spirit of the infinitely small, into the practical administration. <laughs> well, nevertheless, the work of Laplace served as a point of departure for most research work in probability and statistics during the whole century following the publication of the Theory Analytique. I shall here only say a few words about two main lines of investigation in probability theory during this time, which became of particular importance for the subsequent development. I am referring first to the development of the central limit theorem stated by Laplace and then to the discussion of the foundations of probability theory. It was clearly seen by the 19th century mathematicians that the central limit theorem stated by Laplace lacked a rigorous proof and that it would be of the utmost importance to find one. A great number of unsuccessful attempts were made during the whole of the 19th century. Finally, in 1901, the Russian mathematician Lyapunov succeeded in giving a complete proof valid under certain conditions. He worked with the important analytic tool known today as characteristic functions of the probability distributions, but his work remained fairly unknown for some time and it was not until considerably later during the 1920s that the development of the central limit theorem continued. The other line I will mention as a preparation is the discussion of the foundations of probability theory. This subject has been broadly discussed by mathematicians, statisticians and philosophers and has always been a strongly controversial topic. Many philosophers tried to give a clear meaning to the famous equally possible cases used by Laplace, but without any convincing results. Finding this way impossible some authors tried to find a radically different probability definition in terms of the empirically observed long-run stability of statistical frequency ratios. The most advanced attempt on these lines is due to von Mises, the German mathematician later working in the United States, <coughs> who based it on two axioms concerning the limiting behavior of frequency ratios. He required first that a statistical frequency ratio under appropriate condition to tend in the ordinary mathematical sense to a limiting value and second that this limiting value should remain the same even if we pick out under certain conditions a partial sequence of the trials that led to the statistical frequency. He had enthusiastic followers and also severe critics. I shall quote one of the latter, the French mathematician Paul Lévy who many years later, in his autobiography of 1970, said 
that it is just as impossible as squaring the circle to reach a satisfactory probability definition in this way. The work of von Mises appeared in 1919 on the threshold of a new era in probability theory. I was then a young man studying this theory and its applications and of course his work attracted my great interest. Although taking a strongly critical attitude to his axiomatics, <clears throat> I found in his paper a statement of principle with which I wholeheartedly agreed and still agree. He said <clears throat> that probability theory should be, I am quoting him, a natural science of the same kind as geometry or theoretical mechanics, designed to describe certain observable phenomena <coughs> connected with random experiments, not exactly, but with some abstraction and idealization. To me, it seemed natural to express this view by saying that probability theory should be regarded as a mathematical model of this class of random phenomena. However, I didn't think that von Mises had followed up the consequences of his statement strictly when building his own system. This was to be done later by Kolmogorov, whose work brought the definite formalization of probability theory to which I shall return later. During the 1920s, I followed as a young man with great interest the powerful new development of mathematical probability and I now proceed to give you some recollections from this period. It was not until considerably later, during the 1930s, that I became actively engaged in the applications to statistical inference. <clears throat> in a paper of 1920, George Polya, then working in Switzerland, later in California, introduced the name Central Limit Theory theorem of probability theory that has since been universally accepted. He recalled the work of Lyapunov and discussed its relations to other parts of mathematical analysis. Soon afterwards, in 1922, the Finnish mathematician Lindberg applied an entirely new method to this limit theorem and proved its validity under more general conditions than those given by Lyapunov. The Lindeberg condition was later to play an important part in the attempts to find conditions that are both necessary and sufficient for the validity of the central limit theorem. It is generally known that the central limit theorem, to which I have been referring, asserts that under certain conditions, the probability distribution of a properly normalized sum of independent random variables tends to the normal or Gauss-Laplace distribution as the number of terms in the sum tends to infinity. Lyapunov had given an upper limit for the error committed in replacing for a finite number of terms the actual distribution by the limiting one. 
I saw that for the applications to insurance that I had in view, this limit of the error was quite insufficient. And I asked myself if it would not be possible to reach a closer approximation by regarding the normal distribution as the first term of some asymptotic expansion. In two papers published during the 1920s, I studied this problem and I proved that the expansion known as Edgeworth series, which had been studied by him in a purely formal way, really did have the asymptotic properties that I required. Those results, which had some importance for the applications to insurance risk theory, were obtained by the same analytic method of characteristic functions that had been used by Lyapunov. A modification of the central limited, limit theorem in a quite different direction was given in 1927 by the Russian mathematician Bernstein, who discussed the possibility of extending the central limit theorem to sums of random variables which are not required to be independent. The method which he used for discussing this problem has since been of great use in developing this line of investigation further. About the same time, in 1925, the French mathematician Paul Lévy published the first of his many important works on probability theory. It was his Calcul de Probabilité of 1925, which contained the first systematic study of random variables, their probability distributions, and their characteristic functions. Probability theory was beginning its transition from a collection of more or less picturesque examples to a connected and important mathematical theory which was soon to be definitely completed. <coughs> All through the latter part of the 1920s it was evident that a strong new development in probability theories was taking place in the Soviet Union. I have already mentioned the work of Bernstein. The two great mathematicians, Kinchin and Kolmogorov, who were quite young men in the 1920s, already then started their work although their main path-breaking contributions belong to the 1930s. In a joint paper of 1925, they proved the famous three-series theorem giving necessary and sufficient conditions for the convergence of a series whose terms are independent random variables. The probability that such a series is convergent can only be equal to zero or one, which is a particular case of the so-called general zero or one law discovered at the same time. In 1929, Kolmogorov gave a proof of the now well-known law of the iterated logarithm Previously found by Kinchin in the particular case when the random variables concerned are simply the digits of a dyadic or decimal fraction. This had been regarded as a purely measure theoretic problem 
and the generalization due to Kolmogorov prepared the way for the identification of probability with the measure that he was soon to give. Looking back towards the new era in probability theory, it now seems evident that the real breakthrough came with the publication in 1933 of Kolmogorov's book Grundbegriffe der Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung. In this book, he led the axiomatic foundations of an abstract theory designed to be used as a mathematical model for certain observable events connected with repeated random experiments. The fundamental concept, now well known, of a probability space was introduced in this book. A probability space, say capital Omega, consisting of points, small elements, small Omega, which are denoted as elementary events, and containing a sigma algebra of sets of omega points which are regarded as the conceptual counterparts of observable events. And then finally there is in this space a probability measure defined for all the sets belonging to this sigma algebra of observable events. <coughs> the concept of a random variable, which is a measurable function of the elementary event little omega, is introduced in the now familiar way, which in 1933 was a great to radical innovation. <clears throat> and the whole theory of random variables and probability distributions is developed in his book on this foundation. The concept of conditional probability is treated in an entirely new way. This book of 1933 by Kolmogorov still ranks as one of the basic documents of modern probability theory. When all these new ideas appeared, I had recently been nominated as the first holder of a chair for actuarial mathematics and mathematical statistics in the University of Stockholm. I was working with a small group of ambitious and intelligent students and we followed the development abroad with a keen interest. Will Feller, who had been turned out from a German university by the Nazis, came to join our group and stayed on in Stockholm for five years, working with us, giving highly valuable contributions to our work before he went further out through his great career in the United States. During that first part of the 1930s, we were primarily interested in the probabilistic work of the French and Russian mathematicians. The theory of characteristic functions seem to open a great field of new possibilities. Of course, the addition of independent random variables correspond to a multiplication of their characteristic functions. And it was natural to regard the probability distribution of the sum as a symbolic product of the factors consisting of the component distributions. 
a probability distribution that can be represented as the product of any number of mutually identical factors is said to be infinitely divisible. The normal, the Poisson and the stable distributions all belong to this class which had been specially studied by Levy in France and by Kinchin in the Soviet Union. In an admirable paper of 1934, Levy gave a general expression for the characteristic function of an infinitely divisible distribution. And he expressed among other things in this paper, the conjecture that any factor of a normal distribution must itself be normal. He said that he regarded this as very probably true, but hadn't been able to prove it. I had the good luck of finding a proof of this conjecture based on the properties of the characteristic functions and somewhat afterwards it was shown by Rykov in the Soviet Union that the Poisson distribution has the same property which is not shared by any other known class of distributions. The conditions for the validity of the central limit the theorem due to Lyapunov and Lindeberg were generalized by Levy, Kinshin and Feller working in close contact. It was Feller who was the first to find conditions for the validity of the classical central limit theorem that are both necessary and sufficient and his work on this problem was made and published during his five years in Stockholm. In my little Cambridge tract, Random Variables and Probability Distributions of 1937, I summed up our work in the Stockholm group, basing it on the Kolmogorov axioms. The main parts of this little book were concerned with the theory of probability distributions and characteristic functions, applying them to the central limit theorem and to its allied asymptotic expansions. A further considerable part of our work in the Stockholm group during the 1930s was related to the theory and applications of stochastic processes. At that time, quite a new subject. In a famous paper of 1923, Norbert Wiener had given a rigorous deduction of the probabilistic model of the Brownian molecular motion introduced by Einstein of the probabilistic model of this motion introduced by Einstein. But Wiener's paper was quite difficult to read and we didn't see its true significance until the great work of Kolmogorov had paved the way. Kolmogorov treated in a paper of 1931 the class now widely known as Markov processes, of which the Brownian motion process is a particular case. He introduced the differential equations, which under appropriate continuity conditions determine their probability distributions. And somewhat later, Feller completed his work under more general conditions when the basic relations are of the integral differential type. <clears throat> Other members of our Stockholm group were interested in the special kind of Markov processes 
Dune as processes of independent increments which are closely related to the infinite dis divisible distributions and have important applications to insurance risk theory. A Markov process arises when a random variable develops in time in such a way that at any given moment is future probabilistic properties are completely determined by its actual present value whereas its previous history is irrelevant. In a basic paper of 1934 Kinchin pointed out that this assumption is not valid in many important applications such as those occurring in meteorology, economics and sociology where the whole prehistory of the process must be taken into account. As a convenient probabilistic model for some of those cases, he introduced the class now known as stationary processes where the relevant probability distributions are more or less invariant under a translation in time. He gave a representation of the autocovariance function of such a process as a Fourier Stilts integral and somewhat later I gave a representation of the random variable itself associated with such a process as a stochastic integral of the same type. Hermann Wold, who at that time was one of my students, treated in his thesis of 1938 the class of stationary time series and proved for this a decomposition theorem which has since been extended to a wide class of stochastic processes. It was during these years, about the middle of the 1930s, that I became actively interested in the work of British and American statisticians. Of course, I had already long ago made acquaintance with the literature on frequency curves, correlation and regression associated with the names of Carl Pearson, Anne Yule and others. But I had a definite and I must confess perhaps exaggerated impression that this was fairly superficial and not very interesting. The early work of R. A. Fisher during the 1920s was entirely different. It was clearly designed to make it possible to draw valid inferences from statistical data and it was always stimulating to read even in cases where I couldn't agree with him. His work on multidimensional probability distributions, on statistical estimation, and the use of the maximum likelihood method, all work published during the 1920s, made a great impression. But he used a probability theory which still lacked a rigorous foundation. And he admitted himself that some of the interesting statements in his admirable 1925 paper on statistical estimation were not yet completely proved. Of course, to me, 
This seemed to be a challenge to go further and supply such proofs whenever possible. But in the beginning of the 1930s, it became evident that the situation in British statistics was highly controversial, to say the least. Fisher strongly criticized use of the famous Bayes' theorem for the estimation of an unknown parameter in a probability distribution, and he advocated his own maximum likelihood method. While emphasizing the difference between the concepts of probability and likelihood, he still somewhat surprising, in my view, regarded them both as alternative measures of rational belief. And he said that from a known statistical sample, we can, I quote him, express our incomplete knowledge of the population in terms of likelihood. Thus obtaining, I quote him again, a definite probability statement about the unknown parameter. This is his famous fiducial distribution of the parameter concerned. I found it entirely impossible to follow Fisher on these new lines, which seemed to me based on a definite mathematical slip. In some applications, it is certainly quite legitimate to regard an unknown parameter as determined itself by a random experiment and the base method is then clearly applicable. But in other cases, and I personally believe that they form the majority, the parameter is simply a constant having a fixed but unknown value and Fisher's deduction of a fiducial distribution must be in clear contradiction with modern probability theory. At this time, in the middle of the 1930s, Jersey Neyman was still working in England. He had been educated in the atmosphere of Polish mathematical traditions and he developed a method of statistical estimation based on what he called the modernized classical probability theory. This is his well-known method of estimation by means of confidence intervals or more generally confidence sets which was hotly criticized by Phil Fischer. It's time to stop. We can pause now to change this. Yes. Continue. I mentioned the Neyman theory of estimation by confidence sets. This was hotly criticized by Fisher. I follow the discussion in the publications of the Royal Statistical Society and elsewhere, and it soon seemed clear to me that Fisher's fiducial argument was wrong and that, duly corrected, it would lead to something very like the Neyman theory. 
chooses to Lolstein's strong opposition to the joint work of Neyman and Egon Pearson on the testing of statistical hypothesis that was being carrying out, carried out during this period. It was not until somewhat later when Neyman's comprehensive account of 1939 of that joint work had come into my hands that I became properly acquainted with this highly important theory which has since developed in a such remarkable and universally way known for instance from the excellent book by Eric Klemmer. My Cambridge tract and my proof of Levy's conjecture rendered me some invitations to give lectures in various places and I was glad to have this opportunity of meeting some of the authors whose work I had followed with such great interest. In the spring of 1937, I was invited to Paris to give some lectures at the Sorbonne. Of the French probabilists, I knew Frechet ever since my first International Mathematical Congress long ago in 1920. This time I met Paul Lévy and several members of the younger generations, such as Duguay, Forte, and Loeb, it seemed clear that Levy was to be one of the leaders of the development of the new probability theory, and his important second book, Théorie de l'addition de variables aléatoires, was just being published. Later in the same year, 1937, there was a conference for probability and mathematical statistics in Geneva and it was quite exciting to meet so many famous scientists. Unfortunately the Russian colleagues who had accepted the invitation had not been able to come, something which has since then often occurred. For me, it was particularly interesting to meet Neyman, who gave an account of his new method of in estimation by confidence sets. In the middle of his talk, he was violently interrupted by Frechet and Lévy, who wanted to criticize. I happened to be chairman of that meeting and I had to use my poor knowledge of French to try to quiet them down and let him finish his talk. <coughs> Having previously read his main paper in the proceedings of the Royal Society, I was convinced that his ideas were sound and I believe that his French opponents afterwards came to the same conclusion. In the fall of 1938, I was invited to London where I was received by some old actuarial friends and met Fisher and Egon Pearson for the first time. Neyman was then already in California. I gave some talks on my work in probability, avoiding the controversial statistical inference topics. <laughs> it was shortly after the Munich conference, and the question of peace or war was already on everybody's mind. In the summer of 1939, hardly a month before the outbreak of the war, there was again a conference in Geneva, this time for applied probability. Fisher was there, and I remember saying some complimentary words to him about his geometrical intuition in dealing with multidimensional distributions and receiving the somewhat acid reply 
I am sometimes accused of intuition as a crime. Among new acquaintances there were Sam Wilkes and Morris Bartlett. There was just enough time to get back to Sweden before the Nazi attack on Poland which started the war. During the war years, we were quite isolated in Sweden. We were surrounded by war. Denmark and Norway were occupied by the Nazis, and Finland was at war with Russia. In our small probabilistic group in Stockholm, we tried to keep the work going on but it was almost impossible to get access to foreign scientific publications. In this state of isolation and insecurity, I decided to take up an old plan of writing a new book. In the years before the war, it had seemed to me that the continental mathematicians and the Anglo-Saxon statisticians were working without sufficient mutual contact and that it might be useful to try to join both these lines of research. Already in 1937 I had fairly advanced plans for a book on modern statistical methods based on mathematical probability theory. There was a German scientific editor who was interested in the project and I still have a proposed table of contents for such a book written in German. But my strong anti-Nazi feelings made me discard this plan and nothing more than the table of contents was so far written. In the early spring of 1942, when the end of the war still seemed to be far away, I took up the old plan again and began writing a book in English. In the summer of 1945, after little more than three years, I had a manuscript ready to be printed under the title Mathematical Methods of Statistics. The book was published jointly by the Swedish editors Almqvist and Bixell and by the Princeton University Press. It contained three parts, a purely mathematical introduction, a theory of random variables and probability distributions, and their application to statistical inference. It was dedicated to my wife, who, as always, had helped and encouraged me all through my work. While I was writing it, I sometimes said to her that I hoped this book would be my entrance card into the new world after the war. And certainly, it did provide us dear friends in a number of countries. I have often regretted that in the probabilistic part of this book I did not give the general Kolmogorov theory but restricted it to distributions in finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. This made it perhaps easier to read, but at the same time it made it impossible to include a satisfactory discussion of the convergence of sequences of random variables and to enter upon the subject of stochastic processes. <laughs>
In the statistical inference part of this book, I tried to give a systematic treatment of Fisher's work on sampling distributions and statistical estimation, supplying rigorous proofs of his results and completing them on some points. I included a chapter on Neyman's confidence radiance, trying to make it clear to the reader without being too explicit about it that I took his part in the dispute over Fisher's fiducial probability. I also I gave an account of the Neyman Pearson theory of testing statistical hypothesis, afterwards finding that I should have entered more fully into this important subject. My books and my work on stochastic processes represented the main outcome of what I had learned during this important period of 20 years between the world wars. This period had involved a complete change of structure for the mathematical probability theory and its applications to statistical inference. I have tried to give you some personal recollections from this important work and I will now finish up with some very brief comments on subsequent events. During the war years, the importance of a highly advanced statistical methodology for industrial and military applications became ever more clear. Mathematicians and statisticians in war-making countries were engaged in the development and use of these methods. When after the war some of the results obtained became known, it appeared that problems of anti-aircraft fire control and radar had given rise to some very important research. The theory of stationary stochastic processes, which I have mentioned before, provided an efficient tool for this kind of work. Independently of one another, Kolmogorov in Moscow and Norbert Wiener at the MIT had made important work on these lights. In two small but extremely important notes published during the war, Kolmogorov had pointed out that the mathematical theory of Hilbert space could be favorably applied to the study of random variables and stationary stochastic processes. Shortly after the war, his work was further developed by some of his students and by the Finnish mathematician Kari Karhunen, who for some time worked as a member of our Stockholm probabilistic group. This work has had a powerful influence on the development of the theory and statistical applications of stochastic processes, stationary as well as other classes. A path-breaking work on these lines was the thesis on stochastic processes and statistical inference by Ulf Grenander, at that time a member of our Stockholm group, and since then my first my successor as professor at the Stockholm University, and now, as everybody knows, professor at Brown University. 
where he has developed his research work in an admirable way. During a visit to Paris soon after the war, I was happy to see some of my old friends again. Nevi had had his apartment sacked by the Nazis, who had destroyed his books and papers, but he was already taking up new work on stochastic processes, which was to give important result. In one of my Paris lectures, I talked about statistical estimation and I had planned to say something about the controversial topic of confidence intervals and fiducial probability. It was a somewhat unpleasant surprise that Fisher was in Paris and attended my lecture. I expected some unfavorable comments, but at the end of the lecture he only said that he didn't know enough French to have understood what I was saying, <coughs> but he wanted to have a private talk. This took place in the same evening and ended better than I had feared even if I didn't hide my opinion. <clears throat> In the fall of 1946, I went for the first time to the United States, where I saw some old friends, such as Feller, Neyman and others, and met a great number of new ones on the occasion of the Princeton Bicentennial. I was particularly interested in meeting Doob, whose work on stochastic processes I have always admired. On the invitation of Gertrude Cox and Harold Hotelling, I made a brief visit to Chapel Hill a place to which I have since then often come back. In Berkeley, where I was invited for a summer term, Neyman was making preparations for his celebrated series of Berkeley Symposia on Probability and Mathematical Statistics, and it was stimulating to follow his work and to meet a strong group of his young collaborators at the Berkeley Statistical Laboratory. They are all now well known for their outstanding scientific work. In 1955, I had an interesting experience. I was invited to attend the bicentennial of the Moscow University representing the Stockholm University. It was a great event where in the first evening we went to the Bolshoi Opera in Moscow where we saw the whole Russian government of that time assembled on the podium. It was a quite interesting experience. And to me, it was a great event to meet the advanced Russian probabilists whose work had meant so much for the advancement of probability theory. Unfortunately, Kinchin was ill and died shortly afterwards. But I met Kolmogorov who made the impression of being a great scientific personality, whom I had met several times afterwards. I also met Dynkin, who was already beginning his famous work on Markov processes, which he is now carrying on in the United States. I met Gnedenko, who with Kolmogorov 
had written the important joint book on probability limit problems. I met Linick, whose work has had close relations to my own work and other members of their strong probabilistic group. They were just making preparations for starting the new Russian probability journal, which has since then been such an important publication. During the 1950s, I was heavily engaged in university administration work and that took a great part of my time. I was able to leave this administrative works in 1961 and since then I have visited the United States, the Soviet Union, India, and various European countries. Everywhere I found an intense research work going on in the fields of which I've been talking today. New lines of research were taken up and new results were reached in the work of old problems. But it was no longer possible for one single man to follow and really understand more than a very small fraction of the great work that was being carried out. For my own part, I have since then during the 1960s mostly been engaged in some classes of problems on statistical, stochastical processes where I had tried to generalize certain of the great and well-known results on stationary process to other and more general classes of stochastic processes. Particularly I have been using for this work the theory of Hilbert space introduced into probability theory by Kolmogorov, as I mentioned a moment ago, and uh, I have been able to uh, read in this way some results generalizing known results from the theory of stationary processes to more general types of stochastic processes. But I think it will now be time to end this talk since I can't go into any details on this later work on my own and I can't give you a synopsis of the broad work on lines of which I know myself very little. It is my sincere hope for that a future development of research in an international collaboration will take place in the fields of mathematical probability theory and the methodology of statistical inference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cremer. Dr. Cremer has come a long way to give this talk, but perhaps uh, many in the audience do not know how, how difficult a trip it was. Because of the transportation strike in Sweden, he had to leave two days early, travel by bus for nine hours, and then by ferry to get to Copenhagen from where he took his plane. We are very fortunate to have had him here today, and we thank him very much.